Let's have a look then. Uh, there are a few questions before we start, actually. Someone did ask about the air brake on the Hawk T1. Now, um, can the air brake be extended with the gear down? Interesting question. Uh, no, it can't on the Hawk T1 and on the Hawk T2. In fact, there's an interlock that when you select the gear down, the air brake is automatically selected in. And the reason that's done is because if you were to land the aircraft with the gear down and the air brake extended, you'd probably impact the, the air brake on the runway first, which would cause you to have a significant loss of control. You'd probably exit the runway. Can't have that state, so when the gear is selected down, the air brake is automatically selected in. However, that is a secondary system, so we do not rely on that. What we do before the gear goes down is we select the air brake in as part of our pre-landing checks. And on the Hawk T2, those pre-landing checks are below 200 knots, and then we say air brake travels in, air brake indicates in, and gear travels down. Then we check a few other things, like a fuel, uh, to work out kind of landing speeds and then we come back and we say uh, we travel half flap we say three greens indicated half lap indicated box s um, and residuals nose or steering box s shows that we got it's an s literally in a box in the head-up display it shows that we've got the correct uh, brake pressure and then um, residuals we just make sure the residual brake pressure is low below 150 uh, psi side and then we just check we've got nose or steering the hawk t1 checks are slightly different uh, we say three for two, two below ten, which is us, us looking at our pressures down the side here because the T1 does not have a head-up display or nose or steering. It uses differential braking. Lots of geek tech coming out today. All right. But anyway, that was an aside. So, in fact, interestingly enough as well, the Hawk T1, when the engine runs down below about 45%, the air brake is automatically selected in because, of course, you want to be able to glide. That was overlooked in the build program for the Hawk T2, so it does not happen. So in our drills for an engine failure, the first thing we do is we actually select that air brake in. Any residual um, hide pressure on the hide one system then will allow the air brake to travel in and hopefully will give us the, uh, the ability to glide that Hawk T2 as well as gliding, as well as uh, the Hawk T1 can glide also. Good geek tech. All right, so let's answer three questions. And the first one that came in was, what's the week like on a squadron? And what do you do during the week? Um, that's a pretty good question, actually. I'll answer that. Another one was asking about the hours. So how many times can you fly in a day? Uh, what is your hours limitation? I mean, how long can you be at work for? You know, what is safe? What is mandated? Uh, there was a third question. I'll probably pick it up as we go through. Alrighty. I was about filming in the jet. Filming in the jet. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so the first question then, what's the week on a fast jet squadron like? And all I can talk about is the tornado squadrons I was on, of course, and the training squadron I'm on now. Uh, typhoon squadrons, someone can jump in the comments there. One of my buddies will, will write up something if you want about what the typhoon squadrons do. Uh, right, so when I was on the tornado squadron then, no week was the same. There's always something you're working up for. So you're always working up for an exercise, like tactical leadership program where a couple of guys might be going out there. Uh, you, might be, uh, you might be going to Red Flag or you might be doing an exercise, taking the jets out to Malaysia. So there's planning going on all the time. Very busy diary on frontline squadrons. Um, obviously, we had the Iraq commitment when we were there. Uh, later on, that went into Afghanistan, and with the Harriers, obviously, they had Afghanistan as well. Now, uh, the typhoons are heavily involved in, and the tornadoes heavily involved in Syria. So, they'll have a rotation through those, always working guys up for those rotations, and make sure they are combat ready and fit to use all weaponry that they need to when they're out in theatre. So, there's always a workup. And if those, if you're not working up for something like that, then you're working up for a pairs lead or a four ship lead, sending guys away on the electronic warfare instructors course. Um, uh, an, an alarm planning course or a weapons planning course. The alarm is a missile system that the tornado used to use. So send guys away on a course to learn how to use that. Uh, that's pretty much all. All there'll be guys that are working up because they want to be weapons instructors. So the squadron is um, fragmented, really. Not everyone is on the squadron at the same time. There's always a lead to be taken. You can't take leave at the same time. So there's always guys away on leave. Um, that's pretty much it. So as a week, we don't have a weekly schedule. The Americans do. They'll probably come back at me now and say, no, we don't, but we don't have a weekly schedule. We have an idea of what we need to prioritize in that week. We have a daily schedule. Um, but we may be tending towards working up a four-ship pilot or something. That's when all the sun just blanked that out, didn't it? I'm still here, I'm still here. So, um, yeah, we, so we have a theme normally. It's ongoing, so it might be like, guys, we've got flag in two months, we need to call guys up on MVGs night vision goggles or um, do a train following radar workup or whatever it might be get guys called up because you've got to you've got to have a certain amount of hours to go to red flag I think it was 500 hours on a squadron um, and some other bits and pieces that you might need to go and do that so 
yeah, that's always something going on. So what is the week like? What is the week like? Uh, well, the week then is built into days, obviously. And so every day has a program that comes out the night before. So you kind of know what you're doing the following day. On my training squadron, we have that schedule come up. There's three things that a pilot or anyone, in fact, needs to be motivated. And it's called the self-determination theory. Those three things are um, competency, autonomy, and relatedness. Those three things are really important. And if you have all those things, you are really motivated. And the reason that fast jet pilots whinge sometimes is because they don't have autonomy. They're told when to be in work and when to fly. This will go on to the second question in a minute. Also, they're questioning their competence, or people are questioning their competence, because they need to be worked up in different practices, and they're always being challenged, and the debriefs are always furious, and people are not arguing, of course, but people are challenging each other, trying to perform really well. Um, so that competency is a problem, but they do have relatedness. Pilots are all the same. They are mission-oriented compartmentalizers, and um, they can package stuff away, and they can just do the job and focus on the job. So they are the same people, really. Okay, so car stops. Let's look. It's a bit of a traffic jam. So what was the second question was about, yeah, what is the day? So the program comes out. You go to work and you fly the serials. Now, the problem is sometimes that changes. So you may have revised for a certain trip and then you go to work and that has changed, which is, which is disturbing, of course. I might, especially on my squadron where it's, um, the syllabuses we teach, syllabi, are quite complex. I might be teaching an advanced radar sortie, so the night before I'll go and do the reading that I need to do in order to teach that sortie, uh, just to refresh myself, I'll do a lot of chair flying, and then I get to work and that's changed to, I don't know, simulated attack profile or evasion. And now I quickly have to spin myself up to make sure that I'm competent to teach those sorties. Uh, and that happens pretty much anywhere on any squadron in the, in the world, any pilot knows that feeling. Uh, maybe airline pilots do. I'm getting a shout out of airline pilots now. But in the military, with different things to do, yeah, most definitely, you need to get your head in the books. So it can be problematic because your timetable can change. When you talk about hours in, the second question I was talking about is what kind of hours can you fly and how often can you fly in a day? On a frontline squadron, you might fly maybe a couple of times a week, maybe three times. I know the Americans, I'm blind. I know the Americans have an issue with the amount they're flying, and we do as well. Um, yeah, two or three times a week, I guess, is what you're looking on a frontline squadron. But you can fly a couple of times a day. You wouldn't expect to do that for more than two or three days. It's just not the hours going around. Uh, on the training squadron, though, if you're a young instructor and we need to build hours, we'll try and fly as much as we can. And we'll fly a guy three or four times a day. Really, I don't mind a guy flying three times a day, especially on elementary sorties if he's teaching those. That's fine. If he starts to fly four times a day, then I'm going to start looking at him because there's a lot of briefing and debriefing he has to do. He's in the cockpit, he's not doing anything else. I need to make sure that he's getting enough rest to be uh, proficient. But we'll fly, young guys, if they want to fly, we'll, we'll put him in, if they're teaching, we'll put him in that cockpit. On the front line, however, there's a lot of planning, there's a lot of debriefing. You probably can't fly three times a day. Uh, and obviously, on the front line as well, those sorties, well, they are in training sorties as well, sorties in Jet World are tiring. There's no two ways about it, they just are. So we tend to have. Uh, a very mature approach about how many times guys fly. So guys will come in and they was, you know, if, they, if they're unwell or whatever, they will say, and they will stand them down, send them home. I used to have a boss that mandated a 10 and a half hour day. You will be in work for 10 and a half hours. That was a stupid thing to do. Um, now, pretty much what we say is manage your own day. So if you're in first thing in the morning and you don't have to be around after three o'clock, then get out because the next morning, you know, you might be in really early again. That's very important. Um, what we don't like is when we're bookended, which means if you come in maybe for a 6.30 met and you're flying at eight o'clock until eight, or nine, eight to nine, and then you're not flying again until five to six, that's, that's annoying for a pilot. That middle chunk of the day now is, is a waste. I've got to do something with that. So we'd rather prioritize. And what I wanted to do when I was a senior flight commander is prioritize an early and late shift. So you can get a week of earlies or a week of lates, which means you can either pick your kids up from school or drop your kids off, help the wife out at home, or the husband, of course, because um, we have female pilots, of course we do. Uh, but that is not really something that's manageable because it just doesn't really work with flexibility So, of the program and everything else. Now, we have civilian programmers in uh, ascent under United Kingdom Military Flying Training System. And sometimes, actually, our programmers on four are, are really good. The programmers on four squadron are, are excellent. But in, initially, 
initially there was a learning curve. And when they bring a new programmer in, there still is a learning curve. Um, it's there. When they bring a new programmer in, there is a learning curve. Now I, in my other part of my job, I look after the future fixed wing elements for three different platforms that are going to be put into Valley, um, Cranwell and Barks and Heath, and also into Cranwell, Barks and Heath, and Cranwell again. Yeah, so Cranwell, Barks and Heath, and Valley is what I look after. So I'm going to have to go to Cranwell, Barkston, and speak to the guys at Valley as well when the other jet comes in there. Of course, they still fly at Valley and talk to them about how they're going to have to program these pilots because we are quite delicate. Well, that's because we're expensive, right? But that's the truth. If you want to burn out a guy, burn him out, but you're not going to get much effect from him. How many hours do we do a day then? Yes, yeah, so you're probably looking at about a 10 and a half hour day normally, if that makes sense. You might be in for say eight o'clock met, which is met brief, which is when the squadron gets together. It's normally three met briefs separated by about an hour uh, to give you a bit of flexibility, but then you might be out of the squadron by about six in the evening. So maybe a bit earlier, I don't know. Um, but we tell people to manage their day. And what that means is if you're flying late, then come in late but make sure you get a met brief. So try and hit one of those met brief times if you can. What I'd like to see in the future, and it's something that foreign militaries do a lot more, is I want to give the individual pilot the power to self-met. That might be an app on his phone. That might be telling him that he has got to go to some place on the station where he can pick up a met brief. There is very little point in the guy having a met brief at eight o'clock in the morning and then flying at four because the weather conditions, everything has changed. The diversion states have changed and I hate that. What I think it comes down to uh, is a little bit about control, a little bit about discipline. It's saying to people, you're in the military, we need you to be in the squadron at a certain time. And I get that, but it is 2016. We are mature people. And I think if you empower people and you treat them like adults, then they will behave like adults. Conversely, if you treat them like children, yeah, they're gonna behave like children. So I'm trying to get into a bit of a movement now of let's see if we can do us any better. And there's, there is that talk through the military now is like, especially in UK MFTS, is how can we do this better? Let's be innovative, let's think outside the box. And some of these things won't work. Some of them will start doing a thing, no, we can't, we can't guarantee that all these pilots are getting up to date with their, with their met brief and stuff. So we're gonna have to mandate they come in early. But some things will work, right? That's the whole point. So I like the trying, I like the trying things and then failing and learning for them. That's really, learning from them, that's really important. That's about hours. So yeah, you can fly maybe three times a day. If you're gonna fly four, I'd probably ask the senior supervisor or the, the senior exec whether that was all right for a guy to do. Um, hours wise, yeah, you're looking at about 10 and a half. I think we can fly a guy, I think for 12 hours, I have a 12 hour continuous day from the moment he sets foot in the station or sets foot on the squadron until when he leaves, we can have a 12 hour day. Now, we can extend that day to 14 via a squadron commander's approval, but that squadron commander, he'd have to have a pretty good reason for that. Because if that guy was to fly into a hill in hour 11 or hour, oh sorry, hour 13 or hour 14, then he holds the risk for that. So I don't think really we'd see guys being extended anymore um, under the fact that the station commander now holds the risk to life. And that's a, that's a good thing because they didn't hold it before. So we're probably those days of flying guys, you know, up to 14 hours a day. And as I said, guys get weary. Um, if you're tired one day, the problem is you might think, yeah, I can push through today, but you don't know what the program's going to have for you tomorrow. And you may push through until eight o'clock in the evening or seven o'clock in the evening or whatever it might be. And then you're in for early met. And of course, although we can deal with that and you'll be in for early met, you get the job done because you're a hero, you upset the wife and the kids. And that's not, you know, you need stability at home and everything. A lot of time spent having a happy home life. Okay. Uh, what else did we get? We talked about the air brake, talked about the hours of filming. So filming in the airplane was something I did, something I was continued to do. However, what happened, unfortunately, there was a jet, uh, I think it might've been a finished jet. I'm not too sure. Someone's going to tell, oh, was it Australian? Oh no, it was Canadian. It was a Canadian jet. It was a Canadian Hawk. And the guy had a camera in the airplane and he had it, I think down in the pouch, down this like a map reading bin or whatever in the jet down the right hand side here. You can it's supposed to be a night vision goggles stowage thing, but we just we don't use it for anything really. But I think he had it in there, but he hadn't secured it properly. He turned the jet upside down for an inverted check and it went through the canopy um, and actually destroyed the canopy. So because of that, and because what we do in the military course is we knee jerk to all these things, um, the knee jerk reaction was to stop all cameras in the jet. Or what it was actually was to ask station commander approval to take a camera flying. I've not got an issue with that at all because he does hold the wrist of life. You could argue that putting a camera through the canopy, there is a risk to life. 
Um, what we do is we send a simple email across the station commander, sir, can I take a camera flying? And normally the answer comes straight back, of course you can. Make sure it's on a lanyard uh, on your wrist, so you're, you're to be the non-handling pilot and not the captain. That means you can take a camera flying, which means you've got to be pretty much in the back seat, uh, which is the best visibility anyway, and you can't mount that camera. You can't stick the camera sucker onto something. You can't do that. You've got to, uh, you've got to hold that camera. So the problem of filming an airplane is not like Top Gun. Go and watch on YouTube the making of Top Gun. There's part one and part two. It's very interesting. It talks about how they filmed the aero combat scenes. They, it's air combat, the jet is tiny. Cameras do not pick it up. It's very, very difficult to see them. I have done some. Type in Air Combat Hawk T2, you'll find some of those things. But we cannot really adequately film air combat in the jet. And we'd have to set it up in a kind of way, and we haven't got the hours to do that. We need to teach students how to fly the airplane. So filming inside the airplane, that's why it's a little bit difficult right now. And actually, although you think it's awesome, it, it's all the kind of same. Um, it just is the same, really. So I'll try and do some more. I will try and do some more uh, at low level. I've got an idea about some new camera kind of stuff that I'm thinking of trying to work out whether I can do something a bit different in the airplane that hasn't been done before. Just trying to work some stuff out, really. Uh, see how it works out, right? See how it works out. But either way, remember, these airplanes belong to the taxpayer and uh, we cannot just go and use them for filming. There's a lot of stuff out there if you want to see inside jet footage. I mean, you can you can see, go and find Danish F-16s or whatever. They've got, you, you've got GoPros stuck all over the guy's helmet and stuff, you know? We need to be a bit more mature about that. We do have a safety culture within the Royal Air Force. That means that really we cannot just stick a GoPro to my visor as much as we'd love to. Can't be done. So, yeah. We, are, we were looking for a clearance for the GoPro for the Hawk T1 and uh, that was primarily because the Red Arrows want to take it inside and so they can show their display to people. I've got a lot of time for that. We should be engaging a lot more with the people um, that pay the money to keep these guys flying. Absolutely. So we were pushing for that. A lot of it is about how do we mount that GoPro? How do we make sure we get clearances to get it in there that it's not going to catch fire, that it's not going to fall apart? Because you imagine some of these phone batteries now, what is it, the Samsung, whatever that phone is? Is it the 7 or something, or the Note 7 that catches fire? You know, and the guy was, the guy's carrying that in his pocket and it caught fire, you're in a world of pain now. And it's all in good going, oh, you just eject. Yeah, you've just lost an aeroplane. You know, you can't open the canopy and throw that phone out. So we turn our um, phones off when we go flying. It's good to have a phone on you though, because if you have to, sorry, hit the mic there. If you have to divert, of course, then it's good to have a phone, because you need to be able to phone back home and sort out or the operational side of you having an, air, uh, an aircraft now stuck in, say, Liverpool or something. So uh, we do fly with phones, but we just turn them off. Um, but this is why, you know, you need to clear these things into jets. You can't just take any camera or anything like that into an airplane. You've got to be very careful. Interestingly, though, uh, although, we offer, although we do issue a service watch, you can fly with any watch you want. What's to say this watch isn't going to fall apart? May well do. May well do. Although this watch does withstand GE. Um, Citizen Eco Drive. It's the best watch I've found for flying in jets. And a lot of jet pilots, in fact, a lot of pilots in general I see use the Eco Drive uh, from Citizen. The Red Arrows have actually got their own one. There you go. Uh, I don't use the Reds one because me and the Reds, we have a history. But um, yeah, this one's pretty cool. Uh, there's a Thunder, well, that's not Thunderbirds one, is there? What is it? The Blue Angels one, of course. The Blue Angels have got their own one. I get a neutral one, which is pretty cool. Um, and I've had this for a long time, actually. It sinks. It's the time is completely accurate. It sinks at like four in the morning to like an atomic clock. Okay, and that's pretty much it really. I'll do some more films pretty soon. Um, okay, yeah, I'm just trying to work out where I am. I think I'm a bit lost. I have no idea where I am. Catch you guys later, Tim Davies.